So, and I'm also going to sit down if you guys don't mind. Um, so, tonight um, I'm going to be talking about noctilucent clouds. Um, here you see, oh, Aaron, can I dim these lights even more? Is that okay? <coughs> How's that? It's good. Um, in this picture is a relatively recent display. This happened in July of 2010 in Denmark. Um, it just appeared actually on the uh, NASA website, Earth, Earth's Observatory, with a very nice description of some recent um, analysis done by um, a colleague of mine um, and the Omen satellite. Um, but I thought it was a really nice display to put uh, with the outline of my talk. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, what are noctilucent clouds. A brief history, why they're important, um, and then we're going to go into the AIM mission and uh, the last uh, contributions to that mission, and then um, I'm going to give a little bit of overview of what some of my colleagues have been working on, uh, uh, very recent publications. So what are noctilucent clouds? Um, noctilucent means night shining clouds. Um, they were named back in the late 1800s. Um, because before anybody knew what they were, they were uh, clouds that uh, illuminated at night. A lot, uh, for a long time, people thought they were self-illuminating, like the aurora, but we now know that they're scattered sunlight. Um, they uh, are formed very high in altitude. I'll show you a schematic of that in a minute. Um, and they only occur in the summer months. Um, in each hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere, they occur um, at in the summer months, uh, um, June to August in the northern hemisphere, and then the southern hemisphere would be right now they're occurring. Um, they occur near the poles, and they are composed of very small water ice uh, particles. Now there's two names to them, uh, two ground-based observers. They're called noctilucent clouds. This is a historical name, um, and with the space age and satellite observations now, they're called polar mesospheric clouds, or PMCs. So I'll probably use those words interchangeably, PMCs and NLCs throughout my talk, but uh, I mean the same thing, basically. So NLCs occur um, 50 miles above the Earth's surface, which is about 80 kilometers, 83 kilometers. So on the y-axis here is altitude in kilometers. Um, on the x-axis down here is temperature pertaining to this temperature profile. I like the schematic because it shows uh, relative activities going on in the atmosphere, both um, human and uh, natural. But one, it gives the altitude of where clouds that we see all the time are. And in reference, here's where not closing clouds um, so you can see where Mount Everest is, is about uh, eight kilometers high. Um, so noctilucent clouds occur 10 times higher than the peak of Mount Everest, and they're right on the edge of space. So why do noctilucent clouds shine at night? Uh, they occur over the pole, and no matter what, no matter what time of day it is, they're always there. But you really need the contrast of the sun setting to really see these clouds from a ground-based observation. So you're in my little man, and where he is locally on the Earth, the sun has set. So the local tropospheric clouds aren't illuminated anymore. Um, but the NLC is so high that it's still scattering sunlight. And so they scatter sunlight mostly in the blue wavelengths. So that's why they look, they look blue in the night sky. Um, when ground-based observers see them, it's um, right around below the Arctic Circle is the best place to view them. I'll show you a schematic here in a minute. Um, but it's around midnight, depending on your latitude, that you, that you get to see them. So for NLCs to form, we need very cold temperatures water vapor and dust to nucleate on. Um, these clouds form in the coldest and driest place on Earth, summer mesopause. And so
So summer menopause is, here's the pole, and um, it's up here right on the edge of space, like we talked about. And here's the temperature profile. So even though it's summer, and down here in the troposphere, we're very warm, um, in the mesosphere, we're very, very cold. So you guys think it's cold outside right now. Uh, it's about negative 225 degrees Fahrenheit where these clouds form. Very, very, very cold. It's also the driest region um, in the atmosphere. The typical amount of water vapor in the mesosphere is four parts per million by volume. That's 100 million times drier than the Sahara Desert. Very dry. There's just not much water up there. So it's actually a miracle that these clouds form, that there's even enough water. Um, and what, what does it is that it's so cold that uh, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere can actually form into ice crystals. So like I said before, NLCs occur over the pole. Um, this is a top-down view of the Earth. And where it's shaded here is around, I think it's around 65 degrees latitude, maybe 55. So if you get too much above the Arctic Circle, if you're a ground-based observer, you're not gonna be able to see them because there's too much daylight. You don't have that contrast that you need to be able to distinguish between a troposphere cloud and an NLC. Um, so the highlighted green areas here are where it is the best place to observe them in the summer months. Um, there's a huge uh, observers network in Europe and uh, because there's a lot of observers in this area, um, you know, this is Canada and there's a lot of observers in Canada too. There have been observations in the United States. Um, there's a and these are considered lower latitude observations. They don't happen very often. But uh, the, it happened in 1999, and then it was the first time that NLC was spotted below 45 degrees latitude. Um, so it is possible to see in the United States. And the last time that there was a really magnificent display, which I'll show you later, was in 2009. Now, the, the commonality between 1999 and 2009 are they're both solar minimum years. And so we get magnificent NLC displays in solar minimum years. <clears throat> so the ground-based observers have come up with a, a, a type system to identify and record sightings. And if you type in NLC into Google, you would get onto an observer's network um, website and people post their pictures on there, plus types of what they saw. So a typical type one is a veil, which is you know not much structure, but just kind of a area where you, you see scattered light off of ice particles. Bands, so type two is bands. You can see this display here. Bands, NLCs. Waves, so we now know that these are gravity waves. So you can see the gravity wave structure in this picture. And worlds, or fronts. Okay. So that's type four. Now, these ground-based observers have um, been observing these um, noxious clouds since the late 1800s, and they've seen all this fine structure in the clouds. Um, but the disadvantage of a ground-based observer is they're very localized in longitude, and they don't know the extent of the clouds on a global scale. And that's what the satellites have been able to offer. So noxious clouds should not be confused with the polar stratosphere clouds, right? Um, polar stratosphere clouds, or PSCs, are a winter phenomenon in the polar stratosphere. So, um, so they would occur like in our winter or in the southern hemisphere winter, uh, in contrast to summer where the NLCs form. Um, they're also typically cons uh, composed of nitric acid and water, whereas NLCs are water ice. Um, and they are implicated in the formation of ozone holes, where NLCs are uh, not. But um, the viewing geometry is very similar for NLCs and PSCs, so they can be confusing because you do need that contrast of the sun setting to see both types of clouds. Uh, 
they should not be confused um, with aurora, polar lights. Polar lights are self-emitting. Um, um, they're caused by collisions of oxygen photons due to uh, solar wind particles. Um, this picture does have aurora. It's hard to see on the screen here, but there's an NLC and a green aurora along with this. There's an NLC and a green aurora. So these things are not mutually exclusive. They can happen at the same time. Uh, PMCs have been observed from the space station. The projector doesn't do this picture justice, um, but here's the Earth's limb in the atmosphere, and then you see the fine, um, very thin layer of ice particles um, right on the edge of space. The typical thickness of a PMC or an NLC is about a kilometer. They're very, very thin structures. So like I've mentioned before, NLCs were not observed before 1885. Um, this is a ground-based observation um, record over Europe. And so you can see that they've been progressively increasing in sightings. Um, this only goes to 1970, but um, I'll show you a slide later that the, you know ground-based observations keep going up. Now there uh, is controversy with this, with this uh, plot because People say, oh, well, more and more people looking, there's probably going to be an increase in observations. However, there, it's not like there weren't great astronomers looking in the skies before the 1885, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, amazing people, amazing astronomers looking in the skies all the time, and nothing was observed until 1885. So what happened? Why, you know, our, our greatest hypothesis is that in 1883, there was the great Krakatoa eruption. And um, it was the most violent volcanic eruption in, in at that time, modern time. There's 200 megatons of TNT. Um, two thirds of the island was destroyed. I mean, the island just disappeared. Um, and it generated the loudest sound ever historically recorded. Um, it caused great disruption to our um, atmosphere and the global temperature decreased by 1.2 degrees, weather was chaotic, things didn't recover until 1888. Um, and there were brilliant sunsets around the globe and people just didn't understand what was going on and they thought that it was a catastrophic event. They really thought that the, the, the sky was burning. Um, what was special about Krakatoa versus other volcanic eruptions, we do think other volcanic eruptions pr provide nucleation sources for NLCs to form. But what was special about Krakatoa is in the middle of water, or the ocean. And so there was a huge amount of water vapor that went up into the atmosphere. And the thought is, is that that was the trigger to actually get enough water in the mesosphere to form, start forming these clouds. So because of this eruption, um, Edvard Munch actually has this famous painting, The Scream of Nature, that he did not 1893, um, and this is a depiction of a brilliant sunset over Norway, and Munch said that it suddenly the sky turned blood red, I stood there shaking with fear, it felt an endless scream passing through nature. And this is all from the Krakatoa eruption, these brilliant sunsets that uh, nobody knew what was going on. Um, so why are these clouds important? So in the last decade or so, these clouds have gotten a lot of attention. And the reason being is um, there's a hypothesis that they're indicators of climate change. Um, and the reason for the, this hypothesis is this data record um, that is from the SPV satellite suite that has been in operation since 1980. And these are both plots of the same thing. Um, they're cloud albedo or cloud brightness. Um, and each point is a average cloud albedo per year. So on the x-axis is year, on both of these, just, just carries this out into uh, present day. And one, you see the solar cycle going on in here, but two, with your eye, you can see that, that brightness is increasing. Um, so, like I said before, PMCs need two things. They need very cold temperatures and water, water vapor. So what could be causing the clouds to be increasing? Well, the hypothesis is that um, 
methane and CO2 are providing these things, and if those two are changing, uh, we're going to see more and more clouds. Okay, so so we're the one of the biggest questions still are: Are these clouds indicators of climate change? So. Since 19, or 1860, CO2 has increased by 25%. Um, you know, PMCs require very cold temperatures, and CO2 plays a role in this because while CO2 at the lower atmosphere causes warming, it um, increases in CO2 in the upper atmosphere causes cooling, cooling the space, which makes it even colder, which would then increase the frequency of clouds. Also, atmospheric methane has tripled since the Industrial Revolution. Um, so methane can play a role in the PMC change. Um, oxidation of methane in the stratosphere accounts for 50% of the stratospheric water vapor, and then the rest is transported for the troposphere. 70% um, of the atmospheric methane is produced by anthropogenic sources. But if you look at this pie chart, wetlands also create a lot of methane in our atmosphere. So with CO2 increasing, it's going to provide more water for these PMCs to form. So the fundamental question that all PMC scientists are asking is, uh, why do PMCs form and why do they vary? Now to get a handle on the climate change, we have to know these things to give us some sort of baseline of, do we understand the dynamics, do we understand all these things, microphysics? temperature variability, chemistry, water vapor, um, gravity wave effects or planetary wave effects, um, large dynamics, the nucleation environment, what, why, uh, how are these able to form? Um, it's not homogeneous nucleation. They need some sort of dust or something to be able to nucleate on. And all of these things play into this long-term change, which is the ultimate answer that we're all searching for. So in uh, 2007, the NASA AIM mission was launched. Um, the PI is James Russell. He's at a Hampton University. Um, we presently have seven PMC seasons of data, and we've just been approved for an extended mission out to 2014. So um, the AIM mission has been an amazing mission, it's dedicated to the study of these clouds. So this is a timeline of satellite missions um, from um, around the 1980s to present day. Um, most of these are uh, SVB, um, but all of these missions have provided some sort of PMC measurement. SME up here was the first one to really define the climatology of atmospheric clouds. SNOWY was the next best measurements, and, and both SME and SNOWY were, were built here at last. Um, they had very similar instrumentation on it. Uh, PMCs was a secondary measurement, it was not the primary. It just, we, just because of our observing um, the polar atmosphere um, in the summer with altitude profiles, we were able to get PMC measurements. Um, so AIM was launched in 2007 and will continue after 2014. OSIRIS and Skiamachi and SPUV, while these arrows don't show it, they are still continuing with observations, and SPUV will still continue with observations. So AIM is addressing critical questions. Why do they form and why do they vary? Um, we really want to know the role that temperature, water vapor dynamics, and chemistry have on the formation of these clouds. What is the role of the dynamics? and is there a relationship to global change? So these are just some pictures of um, AIM here in the lab before it was launched. Um, you can see how big it is with respect to <coughs> this engineer that is uh, wrapping things up. Actually, this isn't at last. This is, um, it might be, I don't know what that is, actually. But AIM wasn't here. We just we built one of the instruments here. AIM has solar panels that wrapped out uh, to catch the sun. And then it has three instruments on board. So it's got SOFI, which is a solar occultation for ice experiment. <coughs> and it measures temperature, um, water vapor, and PMCs, among other things. Um, SIPS, which is the instrument that was built here, 
that I specifically worked on. It's got four cameras, and so it's imaging the clouds as it flies over. And then uh, the cosmic dust experiment. Um, unfortunately, the cosmic dust experiment was, it's a, um, dust was impacting these plates, and they were gonna count and see the size of um, how much dust they collected. It was, it's a very sensitive detector. Unfortunately, it was too sensitive, and it was so sensitive, it did an excellent job of measuring the electronic noise on the spacecraft instead of the dust impact. So unfortunately, that <coughs> CDE got decommissioned, and it's no longer um, in operation right now. So, um, so as I said before, SOFI is a solar application, so it's looking through the clouds at the sun as it, uh, as um, AIM comes over the horizon. And then SIPS follows up and looks straight down Nader um, and images these clouds with the four cameras that it has. <coughs> so AIM has been a very challenging spacecraft and it had a very near-death experience. Um, beginning of its life in uh, space. However, it's been an outstanding success <laughs> scientifically. Um, and uh, both scientifically and as a, from an operations point of view. Um, it's near-death experience is that we have a defective uplink problem. Um, it likes to talk to us, but doesn't like to listen. So we have not lost much data at all from the AIM spacecraft. It still sends us data. However, sending up uplink um, and commands has been a big, big issue. So this plot shows percentage of big lock achieved from the beginning of the mission till now. So we were at 100% and now we are sporadically at 1%. So about every 20 days or so we get an uplink. This has been very challenging because NASA doesn't like that you don't have something very consistent that they can count on. So it's been a very um, amazing uh, dedication from the engineers and the operations team to get the AIM satellite into autonomous mode, meaning we don't really have to talk to it. It can operate itself. And this is the first NASA mission that um, is autonomously run. So if we go in to a time period that we don't get contact with it. We still try to get contact with it every day, but if NASA pulls the plug on that type of support, it'll be able to operate autonomously. Which we do here. That's right, right over there. <laughs> <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so this is a um, simulation of the AIM launch. I thought it was pretty cool. But, um, I'm just gonna run it here. <coughs> but it flew on the Pegasus rocket, so that was the Pegasus rocket that was just dropped from an air aircraft, um, going in, dropped stage one. Um, so it's going to drop stage two here in a minute, and it's going to open up these panels, um, so you'll be able to see, well, I guess the panel's not first, AIM satellite still trying to get it up into orbit. Uh, AIM's orbit is around 600 kilometers. It's in a um, sun-synchronous orbit, meaning that um, it's the same local time at all longitudes that it, that it covers. Um, when it flies over the equator on one half of the pole, it's at noon, and when it comes back around and flies over the other uh, equator um, crossing, it's at uh, midnight, so it's a new midnight orbit. It has 15 orbits per day. Um, so it gets full global coverage. Um, <coughs> so now it's in orbit, and then right after we uh, got it in orbit, they deployed the um, solar panels, which you'll see here. So this is the best part, because it makes it look like AIM is flying. <laughs> We don't know what really happened that way, but. <coughs> so, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, as far as scientific results, is from the SIPS um, instrument. So, I'm mostly familiar with the SIPS instrument. Um, 
this is one orbit of SIPS data. Now SIPS has four cameras on board, and um, we piece together the, uh, the images. Each, um, it's, it's four images stacked together, which I'll show you in a minute, but um, each one of those, um, we take one every 43 seconds, so there's a lot of overlap. And we piece those together and we get an orbit. It's hard to kind of see in the projector here, but you can kind of see this blue outline of the orbit, and then the darker blue is the clouds. Um, and I'm gonna blow this up so you can see the very fine structure that we can now see on a global scale. So instead of seeing the structure from a ground-based observation, which has been seen for decades, um, we're now seeing this fine structure from um, the SIPS instrument on satellite, uh, in satellite. So one of our data products is to combine um, these uh, orbits together and create what we like to call a daisy. <coughs> Um, this is kind of blown in scale, so you can see the super bright clouds are, are almost white and they're dimmer, but what is absolutely amazing is the amount of structure that you can see in the clouds. And what we do now is we piece all the days together for a particular season. So this is the previous Northern Hemisphere season. Down here, it's, I'm sure you guys can't see this, but it's counting in days, so it just turned to June 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. You can see the clouds have now formed they're getting um, long, uh, down farther in latitude and extent, and it covers the whole pole. You can see the dynamics going on um, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, uh, and just how variable these clouds are. Now you can see the season's winding down, clouds are going away until they're gone. And one of my um, contributions to uh, the scientific results of SIPs, um, PMCs, is to study the global extent of the clouds and determine um, uh, what kind of uh, dominant large-scale dynamics are controlling these clouds. And what we found is that it's um, a five-day planetary wave that does a lot of the controlling. Um, the two-day wave is in there too. We call these global dynamics because they affect all longitudes. And the five-day wave is a natural occurring wave that happens in our atmosphere just, um, just through natural perturbations. Um, and you can see that in, the, in these uh, um, daisies of the clouds. So basically it's a five-day wave because it goes, the clouds go around the uh, globe in five days. So here you can see it starts at uh, this particular longitude, and as you go in five days, it's almost back. So this is a, a controlling feature of the distribution of those clouds on the global scale. <coughs> Another way that we look at uh, the um, observations of SIPs is we like to characterize what the season extent is. So this is SIPs observation frequency. This is in percent, so we basically count on how many um, observations we get versus how many we don't. Um, on the bottom here is days from solstice. Okay, so solstice is zero, and it goes from usually negative 20 to uh, um, about 70 days after solstice. So you can see 2007, 8, 9, and 10, things are pretty similar um, up at the pole. So this is 85 degrees latitude down to 60 in all four plots. Um, you can see that there's a higher frequency at the pole and then less frequent as you get down to the lower latitudes. Um, because of SIPs observing um, technique and that um, the wavelength that we measure at is 265 nanometers, we're very sensitive to ozone um, background. And so once we get down to uh, lower than 65 degrees latitude, um, it's very hard for us to distinguish what's ozone and what's scattering from clouds, and we lose our signal. And so unfortunately, we don't get to observe with the SIPS instrument the very low latitude clouds. <coughs> now the SOFINI instrument is um, a very special instrument because what one of the things that we always wish that we had was that a, a measurement of water, ice, 
and temperature all at the same time. So we can figure out what's controlling the variability of these clouds. And Sophie's able to do that. So um, this plot over here is all seasons in the southern hemisphere that Sophie has measured so far. This is mesospheric temperature. So you can see at the beginning of the season, we're up at 160 degrees Kelvin or so. And then the temperatures dip, come down, and at the end of the season, they go back up. The red line here is the season that we're currently in. Okay? So we've measured up to um, day, almost day 40, uh, days past solstice. Now you can see that here is ice frequency, okay? And the red line is the current season. This is a very warm year. You can see the red line is above the other years so far. Now we're turning around and we're going into solar maximum on our way to a solar maximum. And already we're seeing the effects that we have warmer temperatures and less frequent clouds. In contrast, this green line, that was last season. Last season we had a very, very amazing season. It started early, it ended late, and we had very high frequency clouds. You can see the temperatures are very cold. So just within a year, you can see the solar effects <coughs> it has on a, on a PMC season. Um, in contrast, this is the northern hemisphere um, that Sophie has um, seen, and so far, almost all the years are are identical. But we'll see in this next 2011 northern hemisphere season if, if we see the effects like we saw in the southern hemisphere. So now I'm going to go into some recent. Um, um, work from the polar atmospheric cloud community and how they're utilizing the AIM PMC data. So first up, I'm going to talk about uh, Gerd Baumgartner. He's from the Institute of Atmospheric Physics, IAP, in Koinsborn, Germany. Um, he studies small-scale gravity waves and NLCs. So Gerd <coughs> takes amazing movies of NLCs. He sets up a camera and takes a picture um, every, second or even faster than that, and then pieces together these movies. And he looks at this very fine structure um, that's occurring in these clouds. What he's recently done is he's taken the AIM images and he's co-located them with um, LIDAR measurements. And these are LIDAR measurements that were made um, at the Almar facility in the northern Norway. So he's saying, that NLCs are, are basically a tracer of the dynamics, the atmosphere dynamics that are going on. <coughs> this is a, a complicated assumption because there's microphysics going on too. So, you know, if the temperature changes with the atmosphere waves, then that's going to change um, whether the clouds disappear or reappear, um, basically sublimate or uh, condense and, and go back into ice form. So, um, but that's his assumption now. And so what he's doing is he's taking the six images. So you can see these are now each, instead of piecing them together into an orbit strip, these are the actual, the actual four images together. So you can see it kind of makes this bow tie um, image. And here's Alomar, where the lighter seen is. So you can see the field of view of each um, image of SIPs is, is gigantic. I mean, all of Germany fits into one frame. So the field of view of each image of SIPs is, is covering a large amount of the globe. So he wants to know how you can compare temporal and horizontal variations. And so his assumption is that PMC particles behave like a passive tracer and are affected by the wind. So I'm going to just show you another one of his amazing movies. And this movie was taken from um, Coolingsborn. Most of his movies are. So you can see here at the end these tropospheric clouds that came into view of the camera. And now they're darker and not illuminated by the sun anymore. So you can see <coughs> how in daylight it would be very hard to make the contrast between tropospheric and, and NLCs. So Gare has now made the first, very first, coincidence in space and time between a satellite and a ground-based observation. So here he has a LIDAR measurement, two LIDARs measurements of an NLC, and he has co-located them with an image from SIPS. Now in addition
addition to that, they also have the radar running. And so now he knows where, what direction, <coughs> and what intensity the wind is blowing um, up in the mesosphere at this time. So he's putting all this together and getting a view of the dynamics that are driving these clouds. So this is great for ground-based observers because all along they've just been at one point um, on the Earth at their latitude and longitude looking up and they don't know if the cloud is changing as it's coming through their point of view because they don't have a global picture of what the ice field looks like, right? Um, or <coughs> is it just the NLCs as a passive tracer moving across their LIDAR, um, LIDAR signal? So. Um, now he, he knows what was going around um, all over, and then he can take that information and apply it to his point source or where he took the letter information. So this is a great advancement um, to the scientific community, and he's going to do a lot of great things with this. He's just starting out with it now. <coughs> so Garrett Hobby is to make these movies of NLCs in the summer months of Collinsborn. So um, while I'm on him, I'm just going to show another one. <coughs> um, and what's great about these movies is how well he captures these fine scale dynamics. You know, he's got these waves going on here, waves going on here. Then he turns the camera, and wow, there's this magnificent display with um, you know all sorts of, of dynamics going on. There's wave fronts, you know, small gravity wave <coughs> dynamics, and this is. This movie has taken over one one night, so one night isn't like you know eight hours. It's probably more like four hours um, that you actually get the contrast enough to see the NLCs. And you can see as the sun starts rising, um, you lose the contrast. You can't see the clouds anymore. Okay, so next up is uh, Mike Taylor from Utah State University. Mike's involved in upper atmospheric air glow, air auroral dynamics, gravity waves, um, but he's been involved in PMC studies for a very long time. So he's also studying uh, gravity waves in the AIM data. He's leading the effort, in fact. Um, he's a PI, or co-PI, on the um, AIM satellite mission. Um, so the SIPS cameras is, is, is the, are the very first satellite um, instrument to be able to measure this global distribution of gravity waves. PMCs. Most gravity wave measurements have been made with um, ground-based LIDARs. So um, Mike is, is taking these images from um, SIPS. It's just a reminder of the four cameras from SIPS, and it looks down straight. Um, and these are examples of two orbit strips that Mike's pulled out um, that shows really complex ice structures um, at really <coughs> small spatial scales. Um, and it's it's a state-of-the-art instrument that is providing us with these images, and they're absolutely amazing. Um, <coughs> so this is a high-altitude circular gravity wave event right here, and then it's blown up right here in uh, black and white, so you can kind of see the the structure, um, and it has a curvature to it. So this is something new that Mike's pulled out of the um, SIPS images. This is really similar to lower latitude, smaller scale events like this that have been identified as gravity wave generation where it has a point source at the center and it, and it goes outwards and circular. Um, and this generation is by thunderstorms. And this has also been seen in air glow measurements. So Mike's been working on trying to predict where the point source was for this circular gravity wave event that happened up in the mesosphere and the cause of that event. <coughs> um, Brenda is a postdoc student at Virginia Tech, and she's also looking at uh, fine scale structures or unusual structures that we see from the ground all the time, or ground based observers see all the time, but now we're seeing in the SIPS images. So, again, here's these concentric circles that I just talked about that Mike Taylor's looking at, um, and then there's these honeycomb structures. Um, there they are blown up. So these are amazing images that we're now getting out of the SIPS uh, data product, showing these fine, fine structures on this global scale. So this is some example of fronts. Remember we saw those in the type three, I think, um, that ground
ground-based observers have been seeing. And these are them blown up so you can kind of see what they look like on a larger scale. So here's are the waves and whirls that we saw in type 4. Right, so we see these waves and these whirls going on here. So one of the things that SIPS has brought to the table that's shown are these ice voids. And sometimes they're really large. You can see that it just looks like a circle of no ice. Sometimes they're smaller, these two holes are here. And sometimes they have an ice ring where there's a center that's devoid of ice and then these very bright rings on the outside. Um, we're really not clear what, what this is. Um, it's, this type of structure has been seen in tropospheric clouds before. Um, and if you go back and look at uh, NLC movies, you actually see ice voids in the movies also. <coughs> so ground-based observers, you know, you bring this up and they say, oh yeah, we haven't seen those for years, but now we see it from, you know, now we're seeing things from the top down. And um, it's just fascinating the amount of these voids that are in these images. And we don't know if they're ice-free regions or if they're just below the detection limit of SIPs, that maybe the ice particles are, are small and just not bright enough for SIPs to detect. But either way, um, they're less bright and smaller particles than the ice around them. So this is a mystery that uh, sci uh, PMC scientists are still looking at. Amal Chandran is a postdoc at NCAR now, but he does PhD thesis here, and he also was working on gravity wave characterization using the SIPS images. Um, the reason so many people are working on gravity waves is this is actually the very first instrument that's been able to detect gravity waves, period, on a global scale. Unfortunately, we can only see them in the summer months when we have PMCs but it's very exciting for people who have been studying gravity waves for a long time to actually get a global coverage of gravity waves. <coughs> so Amal took these images and he came up with an automated uh, detection system of when they have gravity waves and when they don't. He plotted them out of where they occurred on the globe um, and came up with um, this bimodal distribution of where gravity waves are. And then this is kind of a schematic again um, in a different way, showing um, where most of the gravity waves are occurring in the northern hemisphere. Then he took it one step farther and correlated it with temperature. And he got the temperature measurements from the Saber satellite, or from the Saber instrument on the Time satellite, and found out that the gravity wave activity versus longitude, so this is longitude right here. So you see this bimodal distribution similar to this if you made a line plot that went around in a circle, and he saw that there's an anti-correlation with temperature. And this is um, very, we didn't expect that, I guess. I mean, it was, we expected that if you had more gravity waves, the temperature <coughs> would be um, colder. So what this says is that the gravity waves tend to warm the air and destroy the PMC rather than create it. Um, Ann Smith is a senior scientist at NCAR. She just published a very interesting paper that demonstrates the impact of the ozone hole on mesospheric temperatures, which then have a direct effect on PMCs. So she's linking the ozone hole to the PMC um, occurrence in the southern hemisphere. There's always been this um, way more clouds that occur in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. And this is uh, she's showing that one of the possible reasons is due to the loss of ozone since 1980. Um, so the ozone hole is causing temperature changes um, in the mesosphere due to the gravity wave filtering that propagate up to the mesosphere. So this leads to a weaker meridional flow and a warmer summer mesopause. Warmer summer mesopause, less frequent PMC occurrence. So this, she's showing that because of the ozone hole, we just have way more or less clouds um, in the southern hemisphere than we actually should, probably, if the ozone hole wasn't there. Uh, Bodo Carlson is a postdoc student on the AIM um, 
satellite mission now. And she uh, recently has shown evidence of what Ann Smith just published. Um, so this is frequency of occurrence again, days from solstice, okay, these are line plots. And I was showing you before that the, the current season is not on here. Oh no, yes it is, it's right here, this very dim line. Um, but I was showing you that the previous season, 09, 010, when we were looking at SOFI data, started earlier than all these other seasons so far. Um, and so what Bodil did is she looked at the area of the ozone hole in the southern hemisphere. And the area of the ozone hole is directly related to the southern hemisphere winter vortex. So the area of the ozone hole can indicate how strong that winter vortex is. For PMCs to form and for gravity waves to be able to propagate, for the mesosphere to get cold, all these dynamics have to happen. Um, the winter vortex has to break up, okay? So here it is versus August, September, October, so the winter vortex or the ozone hole area is very high, and then it's decreasing, 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 and right around here is where the PMC season starts, okay, where the winter vortex breaks up. You can see the red line for the Southern Hemisphere uh, 09, 010 broke up really early, okay? So the ozone hole went away earlier than previous seasons, and therefore the PMCs were able to start earlier in that season. So this is all this is all brand new stuff. We're just trying to understand, but um, Ann Smith's uh, work that she did on linking the ozone hole to mesospheric temperatures is really driving us to understand what drives the start of a PMC season. And now we know that it's linked to, to the ozone hole. <coughs> Dan Marsh is also a senior scientist at NCAR. Um, he and I worked together for three years at NCAR uh, recently. Um, and our contribution is that we really wanted to look at the long-term trend that we see by SUV and linking that to climate change. So we used their state-of-the-art WACA model and we put in um, PMC microphysics into that model and we ran it for 30 years. This model is a free-running model. It has, it's state-of-the-art, it's got all the best estimates of what's going on in the atmosphere. It takes um, tons, uh, 100 and some processors to run. Um, it takes about, it's about one to one. It takes 24 hours to run a day a model. Okay, so we ran this for 30, 30 years, maybe it's eight hours to run a day of model. And we got out PMC albedo, okay? And we compared it to the plot that I showed you before from Matt Delenn and the SVV data that was published in 2007 that shows that PMC albedo is increasing. And this is our model output that we were able to reproduce trend that we see in PMCs and brightness that is measured by the SPV data. So this is fantastic. I mean, we just can't believe it. We actually reproduced the um, satellite data set on the first try. It was amazing. So then they gave us the opportunity to investigate methane, CO2. So we're thinking, this is great. We're going to be able to figure out what is driving this climate change indicator of PMCs. Is it methane? Is it CO2? What's going on? Didn't work out that way. We changed the methane so that it wasn't increasing and re ran the model. Didn't re the, the trend was still there. Did it for CO2? The trend's still there. So it wasn't until we combined, well, no, the trend went away, I guess, for both of them. That's why we went. But we, did, we changed methane, we changed CO2, the trend went away. We were hoping there was going to be a smoking gun. There's no smoking gun. It wasn't until we put all the combinations together, methane and CO2, that we actually got the trend. So that tells us that methane and CO2 are, com are combining to help us get this trend. It's not just one or the other, it's both. So there was no clear cut reason for this trend. So we're still investigating it. Um, the other surprising thing that happened is we decided to change CFCs and their impact on the trend. And sure enough, it actually had more of an impact than we thought. In fact, probably more of an impact than methane and CO2. The good news about C 
CSEs is that the prediction is that if we're getting better, it's going to go away. So is that going to change our PMC trend? PMC is going to stop increasing? I don't know. These are all things that, that we're still researching and trying to figure out. <coughs> um, I mentioned earlier these low latitude cloud occurrences. So this is in 2009. And it's hard to tell here, but SIPs did pick up this low latitude event that happened in 2009. Um, so the last time that a huge event occurred in the northern hemisphere, lower latitudes, was in 1999, which was a solar minimum year. This is a picture taken at Utah State University by Mike Taylor, um, 41.7 degrees latitude. Um, you can see the NLCs that are occurring here at night. Uh, Richard King took this picture on July 15, 2009 at Cold Creek Canyon. You can kind of see the PMCs that are occurring here. This happened to be an amazing event that covered uh, several continents. And they call it the Bastille Day event because here is France celebrating Bastille Day. And what do they have behind them but a spectacular NLC event? <laughs> <laughs> this happened on July 14, 2009. Here's another picture um, in France of the NLC event. This picture is my favorite picture because I took it. <laughs> this happened on the Bastille Day event. All the AIM, or all the PNC scientists, most of the PNC community were at Stockholm at a um, AIM workshop, or a, uh, actually it wasn't an AIM workshop, it was just a PMC workshop. We had it in Stockholm, Sweden in July because a lot of us, like myself, had been studying clouds for 11 years and never gotten to see one with my own eyes. So um, we were up every night at, during the day at conference, at night up looking for NLCs, and we were pleasantly surprised by this amazing display we got to have. But it turns out we didn't have to go so far to see them because here they are in Bozeman, Montana on July 15th, the next day. And here they are in South Dakota, Aberdeen, South Dakota. And so it just so happened that this amazing display that a lot of North American and European um, people got to see um, happened while we were all in Stockholm. But it, it was proven later that we still don't know why they go down to such low latitudes sometimes. And you know, it looks like that the solar cycle has, has an effect on it because they're just, um, the, the temperature is just colder up there at solar minimum. Um, but the five day wave ended up having a play in this also. It was right, the five day wave was coming around. Remember I was showing you how it goes around at five days and uh, it was hitting uh, these latitudes right at that time, these longitudes. So, um, so we'll see, maybe in another 10 years, we'll have another solar <laughs> minimum and they'll, <laughs> they'll be lower <coughs> in latitude, but don't expect to see them in the next five years or so down here, just with us going to the solar maximum. But then again, what I hear from the solar guys here at LASP is that uh, the, the solar cycle is dipping again in the solar minimum. So we'll see um, if, uh, if we have a good northern hemisphere 2011 season. So AIM has been extended to 2014. Um, there's still a lot we haven't discovered yet. I've just shown you the tip of the iceberg here in this um, talk. Um, new investigations, a lot of it has to do with, um, there's a lot of talk about teleconnections that the dynamics that are going on in the southern hemisphere winter are affecting our northern hemisphere summer. And um, Bodo Carlson has been leading that effort. Um, so she's gonna continue on studying that. Um, there's a lot of interannual variability in the clouds. You can see it um, in those, uh, you know, if you look <coughs> here. See, there's a lot of ups and downs going on in the clouds. Um, and we really want to understand that. We know that what drives that up and down is the temperature. We know that, but we don't know why. We don't know why all of a sudden we'll get a warming and all the clouds will go away. 
and then it will get cold again. And we don't we don't understand what's perturbing the atmosphere to all of a sudden warm it. So um, that will be a topic of um, those are things that we'll be investigating um, with our extended time. Um, <coughs> Uh, of course, long-term trends and the solar input. Um, you know, to 2014, we'll be able to get a large portion of the solar cycle, and so that will be really helpful to see uh, how the sun's going to affect uh, this um, mission and, and our PMC observations. So, so those are the things that are coming down the line, and that's all I have for you today. So, thank you very much for coming.